everybody. This is Jay Klaus, the Community Experience Director at SPI, and I'm joined by Wes Cowell, the co-founder of Maven. Wes, hello. Thanks for taking some time with us today. Hey, Jay. Great to be here. Just to get everybody on the same level, make sure we're we're aware of what we're talking about here. I want to talk a lot about cohort-based courses. And so to start, I would love for you to describe how you would define a cohort-based course. I have a pretty broad definition of a cohort-based course because the the category is so new that there's a bunch of innovation happening. But I think at a broad level, it's a course where there is a start and an end date, and you are learning online with a cohort of other students. So whether that course is three days, one week, three weeks, eight weeks, it's basically going through this experience in a much more um, engaging community-driven way than what traditional online learning used to be, which was mainly driven by evergreen self-paced courses, which tend to be a little bit more of a solo activity. And when did you really begin spending a lot of your time thinking about cohort-based courses as a means of learning and education? In 2015, when Seth Godin and I started the Alt-MBA, that really kicked off this category of cohort-based courses. And back then, there wasn't even a name for the kind of course that we were doing. Um, but, But what inspired us was looking at the low completion rates for self-paced courses. You know, one of my first projects working with Seth uh, in in 2014 was creating a Udemy course for him. And we were putting a ton of work into this amazing course. And in the process of building it, I realized that the completion rates were super low, seven to 10% of people who start courses actually finish them. And there was a recent MIT study that said that that number could be as low as three to 6%. So from the creator, the instructor side, it felt like such a shame that we were putting so much love into this course that, you know, so many people weren't actually going to to see uh, the end of. And so we started kicking around some ideas for, you know, what if we flip the script on what online learning could be? And what if instead of it being self-paced, there were mandatory times where you had to meet with your group? And what if instead of it being a mainly solo exercise, it was mainly group-driven, community-driven? And you know, what if instead of it being free or you know, 20 to $50 a pop for a course, it was something that was expensive enough that students felt like they had skin in the game and felt accountability for needing to show up. So that really kicked off throwing around these ideas that eventually became the Alt MBA and eventually inspired a whole cadre of courses that um, are now what we call cohort-based courses that have this blend of both the live synchronous pieces and also the asynchronous pieces of online learning. I went through Alt MBA in 2017 and I'm trying to think back to that time because it was a unique, very different experience. It feels like today, you know, I hear CBC and I have a good idea of what that might be. But back then it was very different from online courses. So it's was there something that made the timing of the last five years or so make cohort-based courses more possible or more um desired for potential students? Yeah, I definitely think COVID happening recently made people a lot more comfortable meeting online. Back in 2015 and even in 2017, if you remember, it was still a little bit of this funky thing to do this course with strangers you had never met on the internet. Um, whereas now, you know, I think because, uh, because the pandemic has forced all of us to do more meetings uh, online with Zoom and um, amp up our communication with Slack asynchronously. I think that's really um, created consumer behavior um, and consumer expectations that make core based core based courses much more of a um, of a of a learning modality that professionals are excited to explore. What are the challenges with running a cohort based course that convinced you to start a company around this to address it? So many challenges, so many. So I think, you know, back in 2015, when Seth and I were first building the Alt-MBA, we were cobbling together a bunch of different platforms and tools. So Slack, Zoom, uh, Circle, I think hadn't even been invented at that time. But if you're creating a course now, right? Circle, Kajabi, Podia, Harpy Chat, uh, Mighty, using email to stitch it all together. Um, And, you know, What I found surprising was over the last five to six years, after leaving the Alton and working directly with a bunch of other creators on their core based courses, I was shocked to find that that same janky setup 
of cobbling together all these different platforms was still the default. And I have personally spent too much time troubleshooting Zapier, trying to figure out why something stopped working or trying to integrate this program with that platform, with this tool. And it's really not the best use of a creator's time. So with Maven, it was kind of this, this the frustration had come to a head. And I just thought there's got to be a better way. Like how has no one created a solution yet given that the trend of cohort-based courses is, is you know, roaring and, and just at the, the beginning phases, I think, of ramping up, um, it just seemed weird that no one had tackled this yet. And around the same time, this was last year, about a year ago now, last fall, I got reconnected with Gogan Biani, my co-founder. And Gog and I had gone to high school and college together, uh, but I kind of lost touch over the years. Yeah, it's weird. We grew up in the same hometown. It's awesome. So it's a little bit of a throwback. And Gogan reached out and said, um, I've just come back from a couple of years of traveling abroad after shutting down my last company. And I'm looking to get back into education and I want to start an education company. And I've been looking into this thing called cohort based courses. And everyone that I've talked to has mentioned you. And I told them, I already know Wes, I'm just going to send her a text. I'm going to reach out to her directly. And so we hopped on a call and we started trading stories um, of what tooling was available now, what that looked like, what was frustrating for creators and instructors, what were things that um, we could take off of, of these instructors' plates. And it became so clear that, that um, there was a real need in the market for an all-in-one solution where an instructor could have everything that they needed about their core base course to run it all in one place. And that that would be ultimately better for students who wouldn't have to constantly be asking their instructor, where do I find this? How do I see my group for the week? When is the recording being posted? And so it was really a win-win for both the, the instructor side and then the student side. What do you think the experience should be for the instructor? I want to go kind of both sides here, but let's say I'm an instructor and I care about education and I have an audience that I know I can teach something to. What should the process be for me to teach them in a live format. Talk to me about that experience that as you see, it should be. One thing that we teach in the Maven course accelerator, which is a three week course that I teach to all incoming instructors on Maven platform is that you want to start off thinking about what are the interactive portions of the course? What are the parts of the course that your students can participate in and uh, experience the lessons that you want them to teach? or that you want them to learn. The opposite is doing everything in a one directional lecture. So usually when people think about teaching, they think, all right, I have knowledge, I have information, I need to disseminate it, I need to give it to you. Um, but that's only one piece. That's a knowledge transfer piece. And actually a lot of that lecture-based knowledge transfer, the monologuing can, can actually happen really well in pre-recorded videos. So that's something that Udemy, Teachable, Coursera courses did well, which was, you know, really bottle up that lecture-based content. So with a core-based course, the whole reason your students are taking this course is because they want to interact with you, with fellow students, with coaches. They want to have a participatory experience. And so the biggest thing that I tell uh, first-time course creators when they are starting to put together their curriculum and their material is to think about what are the lessons that your students can experience firsthand? It's that I do, we do, you do pedagogy framework, where it's I do is, you know, I lecture, I, I show you. Uh, we do is we do it together. So you try and I look over your shoulder. And then you do is you do it yourself. And so you really want to focus on that we do and you do piece so that your students, 75% of the time that they're in your course, are role playing, they're debating, they're critiquing each other's work, they're working on a project, they're writing something, they're shipping something. Um, and then only, only the material that you really can't think of a way for them to learn it in a participatory way, you then put that in that 25% of one directional lecture. How challenging is it for somebody who's maybe created a course before and put it on Udemy or Coursera or Teachable? How challenging is it for them to shift their way of thinking to develop this live participatory interactive experience? It's definitely a mindset shift. I think most of the time, you know, starting from when we're kids learning in elementary school, it's the sage on stage model, right? The teacher's in front of the room and everyone else needs to sit silently all the way to, if you think about keynote talks now or Ted talks, right? It's still that sage on stage model. Um, so it definitely is a mindset shift, 
but it's one that I found that a lot of um, self-paced course creators adopt really quickly. I think a lot of self-paced course creators are also doing consulting or they're doing coaching or they're meeting with clients. And so they're used to that bi-directional relationship too. They just maybe haven't done it in a, in a course format. So once they, once they understand that, okay, this is what my students really want from me. They want that interaction. They want it both interact with me and with fellow students. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty seamless transition, I would say. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that when you have a MOOC, a, a pre-recorded course, you already have such a leg up compared to someone who's starting from scratch, right? A huge part of creating a course is the content, is literally putting together the curriculum of, well, what are my students learning this day and that day and, and that other day? Um, and so when you have a MOOC already done, you can take the content that you have and then build off of it and think about what are ways where I can turn some of this stuff that used to be one directional into something that's bi-directional. How do I create exercises, project prompts, breakouts? So uh, it's really like if you're reading a book, you know, at the end of every chapter, there's those questions. It's like five questions and it'll say like, it'll basically recap what you learned in that chapter and ask you a couple of questions to dive into. And most people, I mean, for anything like me, will read the book and just kind of skip through those questions. Like, oh, I'll come back to that. I want to keep reading because this is so much fun. Um, but a core-based course is kind of like pausing so that your students can do those actual questions and apply what it is that you just taught them with each other, with their own work. If I'm coming to this and maybe I have uh, built MOOCs before, maybe I have a pre-recorded course, but I'm thinking about a new course entirely. How should I think about do I make a MOOC? Do I make a pre-recorded course or do I make a cohort-based course? Like talk to me about the decision-making matrix you would give to somebody who's thinking about creating an educational course and wondering which format is right for me this time. There's pros and cons with starting with one or the other. So I would say that if you are wanting to test your content and test what resonates with your audience, then starting with a cohort-based course could be a good idea. And the reason for that is that the live format is ironically more forgiving in many ways with needing to be as polished. The fact that everyone is there together in real time and you can jam and you can react to what people's questions are and you can shift gears and adapt, that gives you a lot more flexibility to pay attention to what people actually find useful. Um, and once you, once you know that, you can then create a pre-recorded course based on those concepts. On the flip side, if you, let's say, are thinking about uh, a format where you have a little bit more control and want the polish, let's say that, you know, being live in front of students paying a premium makes you a little bit nervous and you want a little bit more time to craft something great, whether it's, you know, a, a newsletter, a podcast, pre-recorded course, these are all examples of media where you can edit to your heart's desire and make sure you feel really good about something and then hit publish. So if you, if you want a little bit more of that control, want a little bit more of that polish before you hit publish, then starting with a pre-recorded course might be better. I'm wondering if there's any correlation that you've seen between audience size and what makes sense to start with here. Because I could see people making assumptions on both sides where they could say, well, to sell a higher priced course, I must need a larger audience to find some number of people that will do that. Or you could think, well, because it's live and I only need a few students to pay this number for it to make it worth my time, I can just be very manual and build relationships and sell things that way. Do you have any beliefs or th uh, any data that you've seen in terms of how audience size correlates to running a cohort-based course? Yeah. If you have an audience of people who already trust you, then that's definitely an asset that's very useful. Um, it's, like, it's like anything. If you're starting any other kind of business, having a distribution channel where you can get in front of people who would be glad to find out that you exist um, is definitely an asset. I would say that if you are starting off with a smaller audience, then that's not a deal breaker by any means. One of my favorite examples is one of our Maven instructors, Shivani Berry, who started her course about a year and a half ago. And before that, she was an in-house operator. I think she was a product manager at PayPal or Intercom. And she didn't really have a need when she was in-house to build her audience. So when she decided that she wanted to quit her job and make a full-time living teaching, she was basically starting from zero, zero on Twitter, zero newsletter subscribers, zero on LinkedIn. And every few months, she doubled 
her cohort size though. So she started with 10 to 15 students, a couple months later, 25 to 30, a couple months later, 50 to 60 students, a couple months later, 80 to 100 students. So how was she able to do this with a very small or you know, non-existent audience? She tapped into people with bigger audiences. So she did fireside chats with women in leadership. So her course is, is on women in, uh, in leadership and management. So she would pair up with different executives in tech companies and do fireside chats where she would interview them. And these women would share her webinar with their audiences. So she was able to tap into bigger audiences. She also showed up in different places where her students were already congregating, her prospective students, and offered value instead of just asking straight for a sale. So for example, she would do info sessions and webinars at companies like Amazon, Walmart, Warby Parker. So she would host these one hour sessions and she would teach on a topic like imposter syndrome or how to advocate for yourself or how to make difficult decisions and have hard conversations when people expect you to be warm, right? So she would, she would come and talk about these juicy topics that a lot of uh, the, the women at these companies were dealing with. And then it would be 90% teaching with 10% of a pitch saying, hey, if this is something that's exciting for you, we dive into topics like this and more in this six week course. Um, so she would, she would do those. She also started to build her own audience. So if you don't have a big audience, the best time to have started was five years ago. And the next best time is now. So she started actually posting on LinkedIn more often. She started tweeting. She started building her um, newsletter subscriber list and regularly emailing her newsletter. So I think it's, there's so many things that you can do as someone with a smaller audience where um, you can, you can leverage communities and show up in communities where um, your prospective students are wanting to learn from you. At the beginning of this, you, you mentioned that the definition, definition of a CBC can be kind of broad because you've seen a bunch of different models. But for people who are fairly new to this, can you give us kind of the average or some, some common uh, frameworks for length of the CBC, how often people tend to meet in live sessions, how they price that, just to give people an idea of what's fairly common. In terms of price points, a lot of courses are between five hundred to a thousand dollars per student, um, and there's a, a higher tier price point also between three thousand to five thousand per student. So it really ranges based on willingness to pay of your audience and uh, your your subject matter, uh, who you are as an expert. So it's five five hundred to five thousand is is that range. Um, in terms of the length of courses. I've seen anywhere from three days to eight weeks. So on the shorter end, actually even one to three days uh, of a course. So that's a, a snappy, quick, intensive course. Um, I took one from, from NAS Academy a couple months ago that was only four hours and it was fantastic. You know, at first I thought, oh, like this is so short, what am I gonna learn? And it ended up being perfect. I think if it had, if it had been longer, my attention span would have waned. My internal fortitude for showing up, you know, multiple times a week might've waned. Um, but that's a great example of a short course. And we've seen some Maven instructors do anywhere between three days, three to five days. Um, in the mid tier range of uh, length, there's between two to four weeks. That's really common. So section four, Professor Galloway's sprints are two weeks. The Alt MBA is four weeks. And then on the longer end, six to eight weeks. Uh, I mentioned Shivani's course is around that time frame. So that's a little bit more time if you want to build that community, if you want to give your students more chances to practice with each other. Um, and then in terms of student count, anywhere between um, 10 to 15 students all the way to 1,000 students, which is a huge, huge range. Um, a lot of our Maven courses right now are in the couple hundred student range, 100 to 200 students. Um, Professor Galloway's course has 1,000 students in a sprint. Um, Tiago Forte with Build a Second Brain has a thousand students. So depending on the structure of your course, the expectations of your students, you can um, scale up and really go after a larger student count and do sub cohorts. So you still maintain that, that intimate vibe, or you can do a smaller group of people and um, have a lot more intimacy and, and uh, closeness within that group too. Do you see these creators meeting with their, their students once a day, once a week, a couple times per week? What's common in terms of frequency of sessions? 
if you have a one week course, it's pretty common to meet with your students two to three times a week. So Tuesdays or Thursdays, let's say, or um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So just because your course is a certain length though, doesn't mean that you have to meet with your students every single day. Part of the beauty of a core-based course is your students get to interact with each other and they get to actually have working time to implement the lessons. So on the in-between days, they're either meeting with their group or they're doing solo work or they're iterating on the feedback that you might've given them or they are meeting with coaches. So they're not meeting with the instructor, but they're meeting with, with the staff and the coaches. So it really depends on you as a creator, as an instructor, how much face time you want with your students. We've seen it really um, range from you know, 10 to 20% of the course is FaceTime with the instructor all the way to 80 to 90. So there's a lot of flexibility with how you want to structure it. Well, some of these course creators that have been around for years now and have done many, many cohorts, uh, David Perel, Tiago Forte, Scott Galloway, uh, the old MBA. Are there any, um, any trends that you're seeing as a successful cohort that you want to highlight that people should be aiming towards to have the same type of, um, you know, enduring success? Yeah, I think one thing that's definitely a pattern with all of these successful courses that have launched multiple cohorts is really thinking about the word of mouth for your course. So thinking about what is so spectacular about this experience that it's worth writing home about, that it's worth posting on social about, that it's worth telling your friends and colleagues about. What is so transformative and makes this course such a no-brainer that you want to tell someone. I think that's that's one thing that I always encourage creators to think more about because it's really not enough just to uh, just to teach, just to have your content show up and 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 give a you know a, a decent experience. You really need it to be something that feels like a no-brainer, visceral, I have to do this kind of experience to kind of endure over the years and run multiple cohorts over the years. <clears throat> the other thing that I'll mention is um, all of these courses put a huge amount of emphasis on iterating and improving their course um, year after year. So just because you have launched your course doesn't mean that it's just, you're just done, right? It's kind of like a business, like a business is never done. Just because you've launched your product doesn't mean you just sit there and think that, you know, the orders are going to come in. I think that's one difference between a core-based course and a pre-recorded course. Because once you publish the pre-recorded course, you kind of, you're, you're done with the content piece. You're actually not done with marketing it either, right? Because once you, once you build that, that teachable Udemy course, you still need to really promote it. So that work isn't done either. But with a core-based course, especially, um, it's something where um, if you are constantly thinking about how can I make this experience better? How can I sharpen my marketing? How can I um, how can I make this even more valuable for my students? That's really when you start seeing, um, seeing great, um, compounding effects. Last question here, Wes, that I have, you know, you mentioned when you and Gagan met and you're starting to talk about this, you were surprised to see that not a lot had changed, especially in the tooling from early days of Alt MBA to today, if I want to run a cohort based, cohort based course moving forward, are you seeing any trends or do you have any predictions for how, this space will change either for instructors or for student expectations? Yeah, I think the exciting thing about working with creators is they are inherently inventive creatures. So one thing that I'm constantly surprised by is how creators take the principles and frameworks that we give them and subvert it, invert it, do the opposite thing, um, build on top of it. So, you know, going back to the course length example, um, in uh, the summer Maven Course Accelerated cohort that you, you and Pat and Matt were part of, um, we had a creator, Julian Shapiro and Salo Bloom, who, um, you know, we had told everyone, you know, most courses are between two to three weeks long. So most, you know, most of the instructors were doing courses about that length. And Julian and Saul Hill said, we think we want to do a three-day course. And that was just like completely out of left field. And we thought, okay, this is cool. Like give it a try and report back. Like let us know how it goes. Um, and it went amazingly well. Um, people loved the short, tight boot camp nature of it. And that was awesome. We then took that learning and shared it with everyone else and said, hey guys, short courses work really well. Um, and so we're constantly updating 
what we believe makes a great cohort based course because being the platform, um, Maven sees so many courses and so many creators doing their own thing, adjusting, um, adjusting the baseline ideas for their own audience. And so on a weekly basis, we're seeing so many experiments that if we were, if we were to do them, it would take years to experiment. But because we have hundreds of instructors out there trying different things, we're constantly surprised by, um, by, by the, the rate of the innovation that's happened. So it's hard to predict, you know, what direction is it going to go in? But I think that there are going to be courses that, um, that kind of break off into different types. So there might be more, you know, community driven, networking driven courses like on deck <clears throat> that are very, um, that are very choose your own adventure based. And there's going to be courses that are the opposite, that are super structured, that are also equally successful. And then there's going to be courses that are maybe even shorter than two to three days. And then ones that are longer than eight weeks. And then there's going to be courses that are this and that, and this and that, and this and that. So um, keeping an eye on that space, I think, and, and seeing what innovation happens is really, really exciting. Well, thanks again for all your time here, Wes. If people want to learn more about Maven and maybe even become a instructor on Maven, where should they go? Maven.com. We have upcoming Maven course accelerator cohorts that we're opening up for enrollment. So there's an application process. You can check it out on our website. <laughs>